I'd like to start off, um, first of all, Christine, thank you for being here today. I know you have a busy week and it's always a pleasure uh, to have an opportunity to interact with you in this way. And congratulations on another uh, publication to the list. Okay, thank you. And um, as you say, I haven't seen it, but I do have a pen. So I have no <laughs> book, but I have a pen. Okay. And can I just say at the outset, I really want to echo the sentiments expressed by you and by Kiran because this has been a very tough time to be living in the United States, but let's hope it is a watershed moment for, for the better. So, um, Christine, you profile 10 abolitionists in the book, and I'm gonna take a moment to um, give their names. Odoala Aquino, he's, I think he's quite relatively well known, some of the others in between, maybe less so, Moses Roper, Charles Lennox Remond, Frederick Douglass, um, we do know him, William Wells Brown, Henry Highland Garnett, Edmund Kelly, Samuel Ringold Ward, Benjamin Benson, and Sarah Parker Redmond. Um, they're the 10 that you profile, and we'll talk a little bit about the wider context, but um, I know there are people on the line who are very familiar with your work, but there are some people here today who won't be quite as familiar. Can you tell me a little bit about how you came to this topic? And maybe in the context of us not assuming uh, in the way that you and I would be so familiar with maybe the name of Daniel O'Connell and the position of Ireland within Britain. I'm not asking you to give a big long lecture on it, but just for people who don't know how you came into this and that kind of wider context, um, just so people have an idea as to the background. Okay, thank you, Miriam. Uh, so some people might know me for my work on Ireland's Great Hunger, or as we tend to call it in Ireland, the Great Irish Famine. And I did my PhD essentially on that topic, looking at workhouses. I always have an interest how governments treat the poorer, most vulnerable members of society. And when I was doing it, my supervisor said, well, we have to look at the famine. And this was the around 1980, it was a long time ago. And at that point, um, and Miriam's probably too young, Kiran might be too young, but even though the famine was something that really changed Ireland and changed the rest of the world, it was something that was not taught in schools, in universities, it was not talked about. And at that point, only two books had been written on this major, major topic. So to me, it was pretty daunting. And the orthodoxy at the time was, probably the famine was inevitable, the British government did all they could, and Ireland didn't change that much. So that was the orthodoxy that I came to this great topic with. And as I began researching, I came to reject that orthodoxy, and I came to believe that the famine was not inevitable, the British government could and should have done more, and that Ireland was changed in major significant ways that still impact today. So that was sort of my starting point, and at the time I was very much out of step with the mostly male historical establishment in Ireland. Now I'm pretty orthodox. So there's been a massive sea change, which is heartening, but you know, it's taken, as Kiran said, um, you know, a generation. So I've written on the farm and I've always, I've continued to engage with that topic. And as Miriam said, uh, I moved to America, I think 2007. And in 2013, I was invited to Quinnipiac to be director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute, which was great, so here I am. But around that time, maybe earlier, um, I was asked to write a book on Daniel O'Connell. And if you don't know Daniel O'Connell, to Irish people, he's our liberator. He was born a Catholic in Kerry in 1775. Because he was Catholic, like other Catholics, he was disadvantaged in many, many areas. So he couldn't get an education in Ireland. He was educated in France. Um, he came back. Legislation changed. He was able to become a lawyer. If he'd been born a few years earlier, he couldn't have been. And he became the most brilliant of lawyers. And he used his knowledge of the law, of the Constitution, to continually challenge the British government. And the main area in which he challenged them was Catholics could not be members of the British Parliament. Even though Ireland, a colony of Britain, had been governed from London since 1800, Catholics, the majority of Irish people, had no representation. And he masterminded a brilliant campaign that was peaceful. And that was one of the things he believed you should use law, constitutional means, to put pressure on the government. 
And this really was unheard of, but he mobilized people. This is the 1820s. And people who themselves were poor, often illiterate, maybe Irish speaking, yet he just had such charisma and such a vision and knew how to use the press, etc. So he mobilized this mass movement in Ireland. And as a result of it, the British government actually backed down. So in 1829, the British government um, granted what is known as Catholic emancipation. So after the state, Catholics from anywhere in the United Kingdom could sit in the British Parliament. And of course, Daniel O'Connell was a member of the British Parliament from 1829 until his death in 1847. So he really became a champion of the Irish people. They called him the liberator. Apparently, when news reached America that this had happened, the Liberty Bell was rung in Philadelphia. So clearly he was a transatlantic figure. So you're a great man, a very powerful man, um, many, many skills. But yeah, I sort of came to him with some skepticism. He was very much empire building. He very much promoted his family. He at times went into... Um, coalition with the British government, which sometimes disappointed the Irish people. So I, I wasn't a total fan of O'Connell when I was asked to write this book about him. But you know, I still recognized his strengths. So I came and I started to research on him. And I was looking at his speeches and some of his lesser known speeches. And I came to realize that not only was he a champion in Ireland, Daniel O'Connell was maybe one of the first or a very early human rights champion the world over. So as soon as he achieved Catholic emancipation, he started to agitate for Jewish emancipation. He agitated for the rights of the Maoris in New Zealand, for the rights of Aborigines in Australia, for the rights of natives in what was called British India. And he campaigned and did so very effectively for the end of slavery. And he really became, most people know the name of William Wilberforce, but in many ways, O'Connell surpassed Wilberforce as this giant transatlantic figure who wanted to bring about the end of enslavement. And so I started to really admire him, not so much as the liberator of you know, Catholic emancipation, but as this human rights figure. And of course, by studying O'Connell, he led me to Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass, had, even before he came to Ireland, he'd heard of O'Connell and greatly admired him. And he said he stayed in Ireland partly in the hope of meeting him, which he did. So I had this interest now in Irish abolition, which hasn't really been written about, but I could see was this very vibrant movement, very important movement. And one of my friends in Ireland, Don Mullen, who is um, sometimes associated with Bloody Sunday, he was present, Bloody Sunday in Derry, who also has an interest in Frederick Douglass, said, well, you know, nobody knows his speeches. Why don't you just try and track them down and maybe translate, transcribe them? So I said, oh, that would be interesting. So I saw, started thinking, you know, just something to keep me amused. What I didn't realize was when Frederick was in Ireland, he made over 50 speeches. He didn't write them down and some of them lasted over two hours, but mostly they were covered by, by newspapers. And so I, systematically, my daughter would say obsessively, started to search for Frederick in the newspapers. And it took me about eight years to, I think, complete and find all his speeches. There might be some I didn't find. And I always said it sort of became a labor of love. And um, I, I had some you know, very personal family illness and Frederick almost became during that time my solace. Um, so I felt very close to Frederick. Anyway, so I transcribed speeches and that came out. It was two volumes. It was so big. So that came out for Frederick's birthday in 2018. And as you say, it's two volumes. But then having done my research on Frederick, I started to understand the networks within which he worked, partly in America, mostly in Ireland, and started to realize he was the most famous. He's the most remembered black abolitionist to visit Ireland, but he wasn't the only one. And so that starts me on the next phase of my search. Um, Christine, when you, uh, in the opening of the book, you assert um, that um, Frederick asserted or observed that Irish abolitionists were the most ardent he had ever encountered. Some people might be slightly surprised to hear that. Can you tell us the context in which Douglas would have made that assertion? 
Yeah, so Frederick, um, again, you probably know his story if you're American better than I do. Uh, but as you know, he was born into enslavement. He somehow became very self, well, he became self-educated, we know how. And he knew um, that he couldn't be a slave, he just knew. And so he attempted to escape a few times. He finally escaped in 1838. He came to New York, he married um, Anna Murray, and he settled in New Bedford. He could have gone to Canada where he would have been safe, but he said, no, I need to fight for other people to liberate themselves. So uh, he was very interested in abolition. He started to read The Liberator. He attended an anti-slavery meeting in Nantucket, and he was unusual. He was a former enslaved person, and he was called on to speak. And he said his knees were shaking, but he got up, and of course, he was very articulate and he had this compelling life story. And somebody in the audience was William Lloyd Garrison, who was mesmerized, as were the whole of the audience, and called upon the audience to say, is this a man or is this a thing we see before us? And of course, you know, a man. So Garrison very cannily employed Frederick to be an agent for the American Anti-Slavery Society. So Frederick did that. And even though he was self-taught, clearly brilliant. Um, if you read his speeches, he has so many cultural, biblical, historical reference points, and they're just, again, mesmerizing. So he told his story, but he was very careful because there was a Fugitive Slave Act, the one that preceded the 1850 Act, which meant at any time he could be captured and returned into enslavement. And so he was very cautious about giving information and so people started to say, as a way of propaganda, really, that he wasn't really a slave. He was a fix, he was a plant, whatever. So in 1845, he decided to publish his narrative. It wasn't the first narrative, but it's the most well-known narrative. And it was a major success. And again, you, if you haven't read it, I would urge you to please go and read it. But this narrative propelled him center stage of abolition. And it really meant he was in even more danger of being recaptured. So at this point, his friends, including Garrison, persuaded him he needed to go to the United Kingdom because there he would be safe. Uh, Garrison wasn't being totally altruistic because he wanted to build a transatlantic slavery movement. And he knew that Frederick Douglass was such a powerful weapon in giving this message. So Frederick came, um, he landed in Liverpool, that was the major route. He stayed in Liverpool for two days and then he sailed to Dublin. And he went to Dublin because some abolitionists in Dublin, headed by um, Richard Webb, a Quaker printer, had said, I will print an Irish version copy of your narrative so that when you are here, you can sell it and you will have money to live on. So Frederick came to Dublin expecting to stay four days just to arrange with Richard Webb um, the reprint of his narrative. And he was so warmly welcomed he stayed for four months. And at that point, you very early on, um, the first day he was there, he wrote to Garrison saying, I'm not in safe, safe in Ireland, safe in old Ireland. But within two weeks, he was writing to Garrison, talking about the ardency of the Irish abolitionists. And even at that stage saying, for that time, at that time, for the first time in his life, not only did he feel safe, he felt he was equal. And that was a feeling he'd never experienced again. And when he left Ireland, he never experienced it. So for him, that was, and he uses the word, it's not my, and it's very important to use his words. He described being in Ireland as a transformative experience. Fascinating stuff, Christine. Um, I, I, we, we kind of decided today we would elevate the story um, of the female uh, abolitionist in your collection, Sarah Parker Remond. Um, I want to give a shout out, actually, one of the alumna of our programme, Ma Maureen Dunphy Brady, is actually working on a book on Sarah at the moment. But Christine, for you, um, can you tell us um, about Sarah and tell us what the double, the dual combination of her being black and female in this context would have meant uh, in terms of her time in Ireland, obviously, specifically, or in Europe more generally. So, um, if I can just say that Sarah also had a brother, Charles Lennox Raymond, and um, he was a great friend of Frederick Douglass. And when Frederick first 
first onto the lecture circuit in America, he and Charles would lecture together. And one of Frederick's sons was actually named Charles Lennox Douglas. So very close, and it's probable that Sarah knew Frederick from when she was young. She was, I think, 16 years younger than her brother Charles. Charles also came to Ireland, and he's an incredibly interesting person. Um, I hope you can't hear the gardeners, you might. Um, he's sometimes called the Lost Prince of Abolition, and I think he deserves to be better known because he was trailblazing. So Sarah and Charles and their brothers and sisters were actually free. They weren't born enslaved. So they had a very different story to tell, but mostly their focus was on prejudice. And they always argued, it's not enough to end slavery. We have to tackle prejudice and we have to fight for equality. So, and as did Frederick Douglass, so the three of them were ideologically very close as they were you know, in terms of friendships. Uh, so abolition was always very close to other movements. Um, one of them was the women's movement. And in 1840, the American abolition movement split on mainly the women's question, not solely that, but on that, because people like Garrison believed that women were equal to men. And as we know, women were the backbone of abolition. They're just not always recognized. And you know, often their names are, as we know, hidden in history. Uh, Frederick, when he came back from Ireland, one of the first things he did was he went to Seneca Falls and he signed the Declaration of Sentiments for women's suffrage. So there was this big unity or large unity between the two movements. Sarah came to Ireland in 1859 and she was very much, she's so interesting because Garrison, even though she was an admirer of Garrison and worked with Garrison, Garrison tried to present her as his protege who's coming to Ireland, Britain. And she wrote a letter to the press before she arrived saying, you know, I'm coming here as an individual because, you know, I want to see what I can do. So very much um, aware of her own power. But as you say, she really did face that double prejudice, you know, both her gender and um, her race, but she used both to her advantage. And one of the things Sarah did and one of her contributions, which the men couldn't do, and sometimes they shied away from talking about the unpalatable aspects of enslavement for women. She actually directed many of her lectures about how awful it was to be a female slave. And she talked about issues of rape, of the way women were treated, of them being separated from their children, etc. And she appealed to women abolitionists in Ireland and Britain. And in that sense, she spoke very, very directly. And again, it's very much in contrast with men who tended to see it through a much more masculine prism. So she really added a different dimension to the topic. Um. I noticed, Christine, that um, when you, when I, you know, go down the list of the 10 profiles that you cover in Black Abolitionists in Ireland, um, many of them you note are like mixed race, and some of them have like, quote unquote, Irish surnames. I'm wondering in your research, and it's a very, you know, it's a complex issue, something that we've taken on in different ways, actually, with our previous programs with Lenwood Sloan and Deidre Humphreys Barker, who I believe are, they're both on the line with us today. But on the basis of the research in your, with, for your, with your sources, Christine, how much, you know, if there was an Irish genetic or cultural connection in the United States, they go to Ireland, did that play out in any meaningful way in terms of identity politics or anything? Um, it's hard to know, but if you think, and I always think Frederick Douglass at important junctures in his life, there seems to be an Irish presence and he, he writes about it, but his mother was Harriet Bailey. And when I think of Bailey, I think it's an Irish name, but you, Frederick Douglass, and maybe this answers your point. He used to say, he didn't even know his date of birth, his year of birth. And he used to joke because he just had this really lovely sense of humor and self-deprecation, but he'd say, you know, genealogy was not big on the plantations. So you know, it was, how do you know anything? If you don't even know your date of birth, you, he just approximated the season. I think I was born in spring. So having that real knowledge, I think would be very, very difficult. Um, maybe the person you're thinking of, Edmund Kelly. Mm -hmm. And what we do know about him, his father was um, an Irishman and he had a relationship with an enslaved black woman and they had children and he actually wanted to buy the freedom of uh, his partner and the children, but that wasn't allowed. So Edmund 
Kelly grew up. He sometimes called himself Edward, sometimes Edmund. So he's he's a bit shadowy, um, but he grew up um, enslaved because of that. But he knew he had Irish ancestry. And when he came to Ireland, it was referred to. But it's something he was one of the, um, he was quite evangelical. And when he came to Ireland, he wasn't comfortable with Catholics. So again, the dynamics are always very different. Um, so, but newspapers referred to, oh, you know, his Kelly, his, his father was Irish, but he himself didn't really refer to that in terms of his identity. So it does vary. Can, um, for the benefit actually for again for people not that familiar and actually for us all for a refresher um, Christine I think that context is important in, in terms of the evangelical influence on abolitionism and how in a Catholic Ireland uh, wherein Catholicism is a marker of identity in terms of you know the masses and the the people on the lower rungs of the ladder and how that kind of would have um, led to some kind of cleavages perhaps in terms of um, you know there wasn't a seamlessness there I, I guess on, 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 on religious grounds. Yeah and you know as I like to say a lot um, it's complicated it really really is complicated so British abolition you know, we talked about Wilberforce late 18th century very much associated with evangelicals. Uh, the men who founded it were called the Twelve Apostles, the men Wilberforce and those around him. And one of their beliefs was it was awful that these enslaved people are denied access to the Bible, that part of our mission is not just to free them, but we need to Christianize them. So that was part of their mission. And some of this attitude was adopted by some of the abolitionists I write about. So I think three of them, um, Ringwald, Ward, um, and you just mentioned and Henry Highland they were all ministers sorry Kelly and they very consciously lectured in Protestant locations mm. which is very different so when Daniel O'Connell sort of burst on the scene Daniel O'Connell became involved in abolition 1823 and even though he was involved in other campaigns for Catholic emancipation for repeal of the union he rarely, if ever, made a public speech in which he did not refer to the blot of slavery. So it was always on his consciousness. And from the very outset, he was at the radical end of abolition. He believed it should be total and immediate. He also argued, and this was controversial, that black people were equal to white people. And again, you, so not everybody thought that. So from the very early days, he positioned himself at the radical end. But he brought a Catholic voice to the movement, which again provided um, a balance and a nuance, I suppose, a nuance. Most of the abolitionists and the early abolitionists in Ireland were Quakers. So the Quaker population in Ireland, at the time, I was the time of the famine, 1845, it was about 3,000 people. So they weren't large in numbers, but they were very effective and very effective in a number of progressive movements. So slavery, um, abolition was just one of them. They were for animal rights, they were pacifists, they were mostly for temperance, but the idea of temperance was you could have a glass of wine every now and again, so it wasn't teetotalism, it was very different. Um, but they were very progressive, they were for prison reform, etc. So when Frederick came to Ireland, he stayed with the Webbs, who were Quaker families. This was the same families who during the famine went to the west of Ireland to give relief to the starving Irish. And when Charles, Raymond and Sarah came to Ireland, they also stayed with the Webb family. So, and a lot of the networks they were, where they lectured, they were provided by the Quakers. So it was a very interesting dynamic. But a few of the people who came who did not stay with the Webbs, um, the people I've mentioned, they were already ministers and they tended to take a more evangelical view. The other division, which is not religious, but just to add to the complexity, in 1840, as I said, the anti-slavery movement had split in America. Um, Garrison was the American anti-slavery movement, again, radical. Uh, the more moderate wing of the new movement was the American and foreign anti-slavery movement, much more conservative, much more gradual, etc., against women being equal, etc., etc. The Quakers in Dublin and the south of Ireland allied with Garrison. The Quake, sorry, and the abolitionists, I mean, um, in the South and in Dublin, allied with Garrison. The abolitionists based in Belfast were more moderate and allied with the American and foreign, or the American and British anti-slavery society. So when Frederick Douglass and Sarah came, they had to navigate these divides, these existing fault lines. And I think it's such a tribute that particularly, and to me, 
Charles, Sarah, um, Frederick, they really stand out because they were, they, they were able to negotiate all these divisions of religion, of social class, um, social justice within Ireland and still to work both sides. Garrison at one point was terrified that Frederick was going to the other side. And he actually came to Britain to join Frederick to make sure he kept in line and didn't leave his society. So it just, the dynamics are interesting, but they're just incredibly complex. Um, you touch on O'Connell there, Christine, and I guess um, one question that I feel is worth asking is how, I think O'Connell in particular um, uh, is at the interface to some extent in that, you know, what we kind of started off with it in terms of you framing Douglas seeing Ireland as, and, and you use the word in the book, I, I read the introduction, you, you use that word, and I don't, I, I don't know if they use that word, Ireland as a sanctuary, Ireland as a place where they, he or Frederick, at least maybe the others felt like they were treated as equals in a way that they hadn't here. Um, but when there was a difference between the Irish in Ireland and Irish American in that regard, and I, I believe that it, Daniel O'Connell at some points is really at the interface in that regard. Can you contextualize that a little bit on the basis of your research? Yeah, and that makes me think of something. So I use the word sanctuary, but people like Frederick would use safe. You, I'm here and I feel safe. So a few of them said that. But I think, and it's particularly evident with Frederick, but a lesser extent with some of the other abolitionists, is Ireland forced them to rethink what privilege and white privilege meant. And if I can use the case um, of Frederick, he stayed with Quakers. And even though the people he stayed with were middle class, prosperous, successful businessmen, because they were Quakers, they were disadvantaged in the way Catholics had been. Quakers, as Catholics before them, could not be members of the British Parliament. And they'd been subject, like Catholics, to certain religious limitations. So even though these people ostensibly seemed to be successful and they were white, Frederick could see that they were not equal within society. The other thing that really shocked Frederick and Williams Wells Brown and Sarah spoke about it was the utter poverty of Ireland. And again, they all wrote about this, saying you know, they come like William Wells Brown says he comes to Dublin expecting to see these beautiful houses and buildings, and he spends a day going, as Frederick did, going into the really poor areas of Dublin. And they were shocked because they did not believe such poverty could exist in Europe or in Ireland or in something that was at the heart of the British Empire. And Frederick writes, he's only witnessed that level of poverty on the plantations. And so for him, it's really shocking. And it really, you can see within four months, he's really reformulating what is privilege? What is oppression? And when he leaves Dublin, he goes, he leaves, goes up to Belfast, leaves Belfast, goes to Scotland, and after two weeks in Scotland, he writes to Garrison, says, you, now I'm outside it, I really have, I've reflected on my time in Ireland. And he talks about, you know, the poverty he's seen and how it's made him refine his view of what it means to be oppressed. And he says, and there's a very famous quote, which I don't want to screw up, but he talks about, you know, I came to Ireland with just one mission. I was an abolitionist, but now I see the cause of humanity is the same the world over. And unless I fight against injustice everywhere, I'm not a real abolitionist. And it's just so powerful that he recognizes that transformation within him. And then when he comes back, is he finding that warmth and solidarity and support in the Irish American community that he interfaces with? So Irish America is it's tricky and it's not good. Um, Irish America, and for many complex reasons, does not really embrace abolition. And Daniel O'Connell, it drives him crazy because in America, he has all this support for repeal, but some of the people who were supporting him for repeal of the Act of Union for Irish independence also say to him, you know, don't get caught up in this slavery question. It's too complex. You're over there. You know nothing about it. You know, just stick to repeal of the union. And in 1843, just as Daniel O'Connell is about to be imprisoned for having a meeting for repeal, he writes what to me is one of the most magnificent statements 
in defense of abolition, the Cincinnati letter. If any of you haven't read it, I would say read it. And in it, he chastises Irish Americans. He says, you're not Irish. You, you were not, this is not the loving as, atmosphere you were brought up in and unless you embrace abolition and reject slavery you are no longer Irish but he does that over 11 pages and so it perplexes him you know why does this happen and for Frederick he comes to Ireland and he sees the ardency of Irish abolition and then he returns to America and he's confronted with prejudice and he sees that Irish Americans are not supporting the cause and he's sort of angry. And he goes from anger to being perplexed to anger, and he writes about it. And he writes pretty, um, um, uh, without restraint, criticizing Irish Americans for their stance, which again, I want to say is complicated, but you know, essentially he's very frustrated by them. But by the 70s, 80s, you know, he's still frustrated by Irish Americans. In fact, they've never really embraced abolition. The fact that many of them seem to be racist, but by the 1880s, Frederick has come to support Irish home rule. And at one point he writes, well, you know, Irish Americans haven't supported me in their quest, you know, in our quest for freedom. But that doesn't mean I will not support them in their quest for independence. So he, again, Frederick just, I think he's just shines a light of, you know, tolerance, you know, understanding things, yet accepting, still trying to change and just, the tolerance and kindness that I just think permeates everything he does. So, but yeah, he's very angry. So O'Connell's angry with Irish Americans. Um, Marianne McCracken, who you might know, she is sister of Henry Joy McCracken, an Irish Republican who was hanged in 1798 for his role in trying to win independence. And she was an ardent abolitionist. And she met Frederick Douglass when he was in Belfast, 1845, 1846. And this really worried her. So she would go to the port side in Belfast and she had leaflets to hand out to people leaving Ireland saying, remember when you leave the country, do not support slavery. So she sort of knew something was happening on this Atlantic journey. So it was something that people in Ireland were really aware of and it really worried them that this was happening. Can I ask you, Christine, on the basis of the research for these individuals and of course your commitment to recounting Frederick Douglass's trip to Ireland, do you get a sense in those sources as to how individually um, or as a collective these people were greeted or interacted with by, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of the texture of ordinary Irish, many of them would have been living in really abject poverty and really dire conditions at the time, even outside the period of the famine, the big famine itself. Um, but do the sources allow you get a, a sense of that? So as I said, and Frederick's papers were destroyed, his house in Rochester was burnt down. So a lot of his papers haven't existed. So, and certainly not for that very early period. And most of the people who gave speeches, they didn't write them down. So what I had to do, and it's imperfect in one way, is I trolled the newspapers, the British newspapers, the Irish newspapers, some of the American newspapers to see if I could get a sense of where they lectured, when they lectured, what they said. So it comes through that medium. And again, newspapers then and now were pretty partisan. So Protestant newspapers would not mention when uh, Frederick praised O'Connell, they'd leave that bit out. Whereas of course the nationalist newspapers would flag it up. So I tried to use all shades of opinion um, to get a fuller picture. But one of the great things about the newspapers is they would describe the audience, they would describe how much it cost. So most of the lectures were free and they would put in, and this I, I left it in when I did my transcriptions, cheers, applause, loud applause, spontaneous applause. So from the newspaper account you really get a sense of how the audience interacted. And in the case of Frederick, how much they loved him. And I think, uh, and Sarah as well, as she was, I mean, these people were incredible speakers, but um, a few times Frederick, and he was very musical, at the end of a lecture he would sing. And it's almost like he felt liberated, comfortable enough that he could express himself in that way. So, but, so although the newspapers have some limitations, um, in that sense, they really do give us an insight into the composition of the audience and how they re reacted with Frederick. And his speeches, they actually, you know, his speeches, they outline them. 
Um, I'm going to ask you one more question, Christine, before I open it up and remind people viewing that if you'd like to email any questions into ireland.house at nyu.edu, Amber will send that along to me. Um, I'd like us to make a note of the fact that um, you're profiling um, these 10 abolitionists, but uh, I think you guesstimate or approximately 80 traveled to Britain in that time. And you, and you, I think you hypothesize probably more that there are maybe um, like many more than that obviously made that trip. And I'm just wondering, Christine, um, you know, I, I know we're always kind of, we're a victim of our sources and, and that might be why you chose these people, but is there anything that marks these individuals spanning the time period that they do out in terms of why they go to Ireland specifically? You know, they're going to, they're going to Great Britain and Ireland is part of that political union, but is there anything that brings them specifically to Ireland or is it more ha ha haphazard and ad hoc in, in that sense? Um, I think it's very deliberate and it's actually Claire Ritchie who's written and he estimated 80 black abolitionists came to Britain and he says maybe six of them came to Ireland. So clearly the number is a lot larger. Um, a few of them I knew their stories about before and there was more written about them but some of them came to me as I was looking I'd never heard of Edmund Kelly before he's a bit of a shadowy figure Benjamin Benson is a really shadowy figure definitely never heard of him but the sources led me to people and then you have to stop somewhere so I stopped at 10 but I have found a few more I'd like to write about so we'll see I thought I might be doing it by now but I'm not um, so but there aren't great sources and that's why newspapers became in many ways invaluable but what really struck me about these 10 people and just one of them Sarah's my only woman but I've come across another woman who also went to Ireland um, is they're all very individual so even though there might be something in common really their stories the way they present themselves it's different and that was fascinating um I'm going to open up to questions, Christine. Um, the first one here is um, because he was so prolific a speaker and um, Frederick Douglass has left a record of his impressions of Ireland, did any, did any of the other subjects of the book, um, the other black abolitionists who visit, visit Ireland, uh, record their views or, or impressions of Ireland in the same kind of way that uh, I guess Douglas did um, and did any did they stay for extended periods in the same way that that uh, that Frederick did? Yeah some of them did so the book opens um, the other thing which I haven't mentioned but it is an incredible source but again it has to be seen along with the other sources is a number of them wrote narratives and so narratives are a really um, good way of getting an insight. So my very first um, person I deal with, who, as you say, is quite well known in Ireland, I'm not sure he's as well known here, um, Olauda Equiano. Mm -hmm. And he is different from everyone else because he was born in Africa. Mm -hmm. So most of the people who come, they are African, but they weren't born in Africa. Um, when he was 10 or 11, he and his sister were captured and he never knew what happened to his sister. He was taken onto a ship. He saw the Seven Years' War, whatever, whatever. At one point, they visited the Caribbean and he saw slavery firsthand and did not like it. So he stayed on the ship and he was able to purchase his freedom. But during his journeys, he'd visited England. He knew that once um, slaves, formerly slave people, were on British shore, they were free. So he decided to settle in London. And he wrote his narrative and it's really seen as the first narrative um, and it's very, very successful. So this is around 1790 and it went into nine different versions. But what's really fascinating about Equiano is he came to Ireland around 1794. He spoke in Dublin, Cork. He, in some ways he was creating a path of slipstream for later abolitionists, but he ended his visit by a trip to Belfast. And there he was hosted by the United Irishmen. And it seems he became very close to Sam Nielsen and the people up in Belfast. He went to some of their meetings. He came back to England and he became involved in very radical politics there, the London Corresponding Society, if any of you heard of it, and the leader of the London. And he became um, an agent for them as well. 
So he can, like Frederick, he combined his abolitionism with um, very progressive politics. But the head of the, because war, Britain was at war with France, and they effectively tried to close down all radical societies, and they arrested the head of the London Corresponding Society for Treason. But here is this abolitionist who really is a link between what's happening in Ireland, because he remains close to the United Irishman, and what's happening in radical politics in Britain. And so suddenly after the other man is arrested, he disappears from public view. So this man who was so high profile, who'd published nine editions of his narrative, um, disappears. We know he dies, we don't know where he's buried. He's buried somewhere in England. And um, he married an English woman, they had two children. Um, so very different. I know I was going to say something else. Um, but yeah, the stories are all very, very different. Um, that's fascinating stuff, Christine. Um, now, um, through the work of Liam Hogan of the University of Limerick, I have learned about some three, 33 Irish slavers who received compensation from the British government when they dismantled the institution of, of slavery. Um, did you research come across this hidden history? And I think from the same person, I do wonder why abolitionists would embrace a Christianity which provided the moral authority for the enslavement of other people. Um, the first question, I know Liam's research and I know that hidden history, but um, you know, it's not the history I'm researching. It's another big, big topic, uh, but you know, it's obviously a very important topic. And the second question was, sorry. I do, I uh, know, I think it's actually much more of a statement. I, uh, well, I do wonder why abolitionists would embrace okay. the, a Christianity which provided the moral authority for the enslavement of other people. And they didn't. And so one of the criticisms of Garrison was he was anti-Christian, he was anti-church. And, and Frederick Douglass and Sarah both got into trouble because they were so, spoke out so vehemently about Christian churches in America that were complicit. They said, it doesn't matter if you, you even if you're not directly supporting slavery, you are in fact complicit. The Catholic Church in some ways was complicit with slavery at that time. And when Frederick left Ireland, January 1846, he went to Scotland and his whole campaign in Scotland was directed against the Presbyterian Church, the Free Presbyterian Church, to send back the money. They were a newly formed church and they'd taken money from some of the slave holding churches in the Southern states. And so he campaigned for months, send back the money. So abolition wasn't um, tolerant of the churches. It was actually highly, highly critical, especially Frederick and Sarah were really at the forefront of that. Um, Frederick Douglass was visiting Ireland during the early months of the famine and said, when hearing the song and music said, these are the songs of my people, did he make any, uh, I'm quoting, these are the sounds of my people, unquote. Did he make any statements about the famine in relation to the oppression of the Irish? So, again, I think people have to not apply retrospective views on it. I think his statement about music came in one of his later biographies. Um, I don't think it was contemporary, contemporaneous. So Frederick came to Ireland. Um, he arrived at the end of August 1845. At that point, the blight was just starting to appear in Ireland. And it was the first time this blight had appeared. It destroyed about 30% of the potato crop. At this point, nobody knew there was going to be a famine. The potato crop failed periodically in Ireland. Subsistence crises, ongoing endemic poverty was nothing new, but nobody could know there were going to be seven years of failure and one of the most deadly famines in memory, in history. So you know, we shouldn't think retrospectively, you know, what did he know? Because nobody knew at that stage. They just thought his new disease, the potato is going to fail. It always comes back the next year. By the time it came back in 1846, Frederick was in Scotland, in England, etc. So expecting him to make pronouncements on the famine, you, it just he wasn't there for when it was a famine. Uh, but he did talk about, and we talked about this, the poverty, and he was shocked by the poverty of the people, the deep poverty of the people, which he hadn't expected. But I do know that when, um, from some of my other research, that when he was in Scotland and the famine was really starting to bite after the second failure of the potato crop. He sent money 
And it's interesting, he sent some money to the woman I've just talked about, Marianne McCracken, who not only was an abolitionist, she and uh, some other women in Belfast had formed a ladies' relief committee, a non-sectarian Belfast ladies' relief committee. And so Frederick sent her money for her to distribute in whatever way she wanted. So he does have that involvement with the famine, but you know, to make pronouncements on, it just wasn't at that stage. You know, nobody knew. Mm -hmm. And, and Christine, for the benefit of people who don't know, I mean, um, the potato, am I correct in thinking that the average Irish adult at this point ate something like 10, what was the, I mean, it was the main staple. How, how much of it, how many, how many, there's a weight given in terms of how yeah. much we ate a day, yeah. right? About 12 pounds a day of potatoes. So, so and when it was wiped out, it was complete, it was taking away the, main food source for most of the people yeah even again people think towns like belfast they didn't suffer because they're towns but people who worked in mills they were poor so that was their food stuff as well so no part of ireland escaped from the ravages of the famine and it the blight came back in varying degrees for seven years and if you don't know about this period of history Ireland before the famine had a population of eight and a half million. That was 1841 by 1851. It was six and a half million by 1901. It was about four and a half million. And you know, as we know, the population of Ireland today is seven and a half million, but not as high as it was before the famine. So in a very real sense, Ireland has never recovered, but there are other scars that ran deeper than just population. Um, I wonder, Dr. Keneally, if your research, in your research, you peruse Caribbean newspapers or other sources to, to determine a West Indian connection to any of the abolitionists in Ireland. Um, I did because one of my abolitionists, Benjamin Benson, was actually born in the Caribbean. And his story, and he sort of tells that he's interesting, is that um, the Caribbean was obviously British owned. And in 1833, Britain ended uh, ended slavery in the Caribbean, although as we know, they then introduced the system of apprenticeship, which O'Connell and the Irish abolitionists spoke out against vehemently, so it was brought to an end earlier. So Benjamin Benson was born in the Caribbean, so he was freed as a result of what Britain did. Uh, he then, I think he got a job on ships, whatever, he ended up in America where he says he was recaptured and re-enslaved. Somehow, it's a bit of an adventure story, somehow he managed to escape and he comes to England and then he goes to um, Ireland and he actually um, lives his final years in Dublin. Oh, wow. So he, yeah, he stays in Ireland? He, yeah, he opens a temperance hotel. But again, I say he's shadowy because he's running this temperance hotel. He's advertising in the newspapers. It's getting bigger. He's, he even gives his menu. You know, it's very elaborate. He has reading rooms, etc. And then suddenly he's in court for bankruptcy. And then suddenly his temperance hotel is a wine shop. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't make it up. So he's, but he was born in the Caribbean. So certainly you know, I use sources for him. And I use some, a lot of the American newspapers as well. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you, I know, obvious, but you, Garrison's Liberator, Frederick Douglass was prolific in terms of you. He, most of the abolitionists knew the value of press, knew the value of propaganda. So they did want to you have a presence within these newspapers. It was the internet and social media of the day, right? It was indeed, yeah. And you know, Frederick was a master at it. Um, what do you think of Colum, um, of Frederick, of the portrayal of Frederick Douglass in Colin McCann's novel *Transatlantic*? Uh, is it accurate that Daniel? I think these are both from the same per, uh, person. Is it accurate that Dan, Daniel O'Connell rarely spoke Irish, um, that, but that he was a fluent Irish speaker? Um, and if this is the, if so, why do you think this was the case in terms of his? Okay, um, so. To some extent it's accurate and I know Colin Tubby and I we talked about his book and he doesn't think the job of someone writing fiction is to really be accurate he, he feels it's very different anyway but it's um it's yeah loosely based on Frederick's experiences I think um I would have liked Davis who was the host to Frederick and to others to have been 
treated more kindly, if I can say it that way. Um, at times, he and Frederick did fall out. They were two very strong personalities. But the role of Davis, his wife, his more extended Quaker family in terms of abol Irish abolition is incredible and in terms of the Irish famine. So I would have liked um, more appreciation of what he did. And the other question was O'Connell. So O'Connell was born in Kerry. Uh, he was an um, Irish speaker, but he was afraid that Irish language was becoming an antiquated language that would hold people back. And so he wanted his country to develop economically and socially, and he did urge people to learn English. So in that sense, that is accurate. Um. This is from Deidre Humphreys Barker, who is on from Michigan with us. It's great to have you here. It's interesting to hear Professor Keneally talk about Frederick Douglass, though I'm not surprised at his ability to negotiate complex um, situations. African Americans are known for their duality and flexibility in language and appearance and demeanor, agreed. I am wondering though about the taunt that any Irish who supported slavery was not Irish. It makes me wonder how the Irish character was formed or reformed under their trouble with the English and whether and where that strength was evident in the United States. Okay, can you just read the last bit? The sure. I'm wondering though that about the taunt that any Irish who supported slavery was not Irish. It makes me wonder, I guess that's what O'Connell, when O'Connell yeah, yeah, yeah. came out, it makes me wonder how the Irish character was formed or reformed under their trouble with the Irish and whether their and whether and where that strength was evident in the United States, I guess the impact of, of, of British, British rule in Ireland uh, in terms of, um, I guess, character formation. And I think that's where the Irish and African-American experience, there are um, similarities in terms of that duality and ad adapt adaptability in terms of, um, managing and negotiating um, uh, American life or and in general but in specifically in the American context. Yeah and I have to I was paraphrasing O'Connell um, you know, I would urge people go and read him you know in the original because it's very powerful uh, very powerful indictment so um, I would just say go and read it and get a sense of what he said not my paraphrase. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, actually, and I have one from Lenny Sloan. Um, Lenny asks, can you please ask um, if Christine knows about the spiritual singers who were on the crossing uh, across the Atlantic with uh, Frederick Douglass? Yeah, I do. Um, the wonderful Hutchinson family from the Granite State, as they like to say. And they traveled with Frederick across um, to Liverpool. They were a family of singers and they were abolitionists and they were white, but they were, and again, just shows you, you know, we look back and we think, of course, you, why wouldn't you be abolitionist? But they were beaten up a few times for their singing. So it's mostly a family of brothers and one sister uh, who everybody seems to love. When they got to Liverpool, they parted ways, but because Frederick stayed on in Dublin, they came and they joined him and they sang at an abolitionist meeting in Dublin. And it was the first time there'd ever been music at an abolitionist meeting so um so they seem incredible and they wrote um about i think one of the brothers is a jesse lenny probably knows who wrote his biography his autobiography and one of the brothers sang at the that might make sense one of the children but sang at the funeral of frederick douglas so it seems to have been um, a lifelong song and just and again i know lenny he's more into the culture but some of their music is available and if you you, when I first tried to root out the abolitionist songs, I expected them to be sort of serious and dirgy. They're very uplifting. So if you haven't heard an abolitionist song, look up the Hutchinson singers. Um, so they are, it's, you know, it gets in your head, but it's, they were, so yep, yeah, they came with Frederick on the journey across and Frederick wrote about that journey. Uh, he'd been, a first class ticket had been purchased for him so he'd have a cabin, but people on the boat, wouldn't let him have a first class cabin. So even on the journey over to Liverpool, he was subject to prejudice. So, um, and then going back again, he had a first class ticket and again, it was denied him. So it, he, he had this sort of, um, I said sanctuary in Ireland, but it was very much framed by prejudice at both ends. And as soon as he came back to America, he was, you know, he, as did Charles 
Greenland, they encountered prejudice. Sarah, by the way, never came back to America. Once she tasted um, being in Europe, she just said she could not go back and face that division and hatred again. So she went, again, she's fascinating. She went to Italy, she trained as a doctor. And then at the age of 50, she married an Italian man. And she lived and died in Rome. And in um, 1887, Frederick and his second wife, Helen, visited her. So it's, you know, these people knew each other. So, and Frederick wrote about that in his diary. Wow, amazing. She sounds like an amazing person. Um, I'm so oh. great that you've, um, you've resurrected her story in this context first with the Irish connection. Um, and that's actually, um, someone just asked about that. Uh, uh, it, was, it might have been uh, Maureen, so th that you've answered that. So I'll take this last question um, before we um, hear um, some of Frederick's words. Uh, given the history of the English shipping Irish people off to labour on plantations, especially in the West Indian colonies, uh, did this past, whether properly called indentured servant, uh, servitude or effective slavery, play any role in how Irish audiences reacted to black abolitionists or just to the abolition campaign in general? You know, in nothing I've read in terms of the contemporary documents, I have seen no reference to that. So it's not to mean there isn't, but I really haven't. But one of the things I really found interesting that maybe relates to this and to some of Liam Hogan's work about the issue of were the Irish slaves? Because this is something when Frederick got to Ireland and um, nationalism was reviving with O'Connell's repeal movement, etc. And the whole language of Irish nationalism is, you know, we are slaves, we are bondsmen, we need to fight, throw off the shackles. And sometimes in the audiences, people would say to Frederick, oh, we know how you feel because we're slaves as well. And Frederick, I think in the early days was sort of polite and he lectured in Dublin, in Waterford, in Wexford, in Yall, in Cork, then in Limerick. And I think by the time he got to Limerick, he really had um, his agency, his voice. So when someone in the audience said, you know, well, well, we're slaves as well, we get it. He actually said, no, you're not slaves. And he said, if any of you think you're slaves, you know, I will fight for you. You are oppressed, but oppression is not the same as slavery. In slavery, you do not belong to yourself. You do not own your soul, your body, your spirit. And it was just such a beautiful, eloquent way um, of making that distinction between oppression and slavery. And a very important, um, it's an important reminder to us because um, sometimes these narratives of, you have to be very careful in terms of that terminology um, that, indentured servitude which was difficult and and not nice and unpleasant was you know is is a different category to being enslaved right and and uh, and and just um you know people can't ever you know you can do an occupation and you go home and you're not in that job or you can hide an accent or you can change your names you can't do that with the color of your skin right so mm -hmm. That, that prejudice in terms of how it, um, it uh, played out in people's lives was um, not something that they could uh, take on or off lightly. Um, I guess um, we, that's a nice segue. Uh, if nice is probably not the best word. Let's hear from Frederick Douglass in his own words. The story of our inferiority is an old dodge. As I have said, for whoever men oppress their fellows, Wherever they enslave them, they will endeavor to find the needed apology for such enslavement and oppression in the character of the people oppressed and enslaved. When we wanted, a few years ago, a slice of Mexico, it was hinted that the Mexicans were an inferior race, that the old Castilian blood had become so weak that it would scarcely run downhill, and that Mexico needed the long and strong and beneficent arm of the Anglo-Saxon care extended over it. We said that it was necessary to its salvation and a part of the manifest destiny of this republic to extend our arm over the dilapidated government. So too, when Russia wanted to take possession of a part of the Ottoman Empire, the Turks were an inferior race. So too, when England wants to set the heels of her power more firmly in the quivering heart of old Ireland, the Celtics are an inferior race. So too, the Negro 
when he is to be robbed of any right which is justly his, is an inferior man. It is said that we are ignorant, I admit. But if we know enough to be hung, we know enough to vote. If the Negro knows enough to pay taxes to support the government, he knows enough to vote. Taxation and representation should go together. If he knows to shoulder a musket and fight for the flag, fight for the government, he knows enough to vote. If he knows as much when he is sober as an Irishman knows when drunk, he knows enough to vote on good American principles. Do you intend to sacrifice the very men who have come to rescue of your banner in the South and incur the lasting displeasure of their masters thereby? Do you intend to sacrifice them and reward your enemies? Do you mean to give your enemies the right to vote and take it away from your friends? Is that wise policy? Is that honorable? I mean, could American honor withstand such a blow? I do not believe you will do it. I think you will see to it that we have the right to vote. We look naturally to this platform for the assertion of all rights, and for this one especially. I understand the anti-slavery societies of this country to be based on two principles. First, the freedom of the blacks of this country, and second, the elevation of them. Let me not be misunderstood here. I'm not asking for sympathy at the hands of the abolitionists, sympathy at the hands of any. I think the American people are disposed often to be generous rather than just. What I ask for the Negro is not benevolence, not pity, not sympathy, but simply justice. The American people have always been anxious to know what shall they do. Everybody has asked a question and they learned to ask it early of their abolitionists. What shall we do with the Negro? I've had but one answer from the beginning. Do nothing with us. Your doing with us has already played the mischief with us. Do nothing with us. If the apples will not remain on the tree of their own strength, if they are worm-eaten at the core, if they are early ripe and disposed to fall, let them fall. I'm not for the tying or fastening them on the tree in any way, except by nature's plan. And they will not stay there, let them fall. If the Negro cannot stand on his own legs, let them fall also. All I ask, give him a chance to stand on his own legs. Let him alone. If you see him on his way to school, let him alone. Don't disturb him. If you see him going to the dinner table at the hotel, let him go. If you see him going to the ballot box, let him alone. Don't disturb him. If you see him going into a workshop, just let him alone. Your interference is doing him a positive injury. Let him fall if he cannot stand alone. If the Negro cannot live by the line of internal justice, the fault will not be yours. It will be his who made the Negro and established that line for his government. Let him live or die by that. If you will only untie his hands and give him a chance, I think he will live. 